Sam Altman in the OpenAI gang do an AMA on Reddit. So AMA is ask me anything for those of you that don't know. So it's like a Q&A, but for Reddit. And we have Sam Altman, Kevin Weil, Chief Product Officer, OpenAI, Mark Shin, SVP of Research, Srinivas Narayanan, VP of Engineering. And this, I hope I'm pronouncing right, is Jakob Pashoki, Chief Scientist at OpenAI. So let's find out what they were asked and what they think about it. So let's see what nuggets of wisdom we can extract here. One of the first things that kind of jumped out at me is somebody asked for Sam, for them to do a bold prediction for 2025 for next year. And Sam Altman said, saturate all the benchmarks. So definitely expecting some progress there. This is interesting for founders, entrepreneurs, etc. Somebody asked, as an experienced founder and someone who has worked closely with many, how do you see AI augmenting founders in their venture development process? And how will entrepreneurship change because of it? If you recall, Sam Altman and friends were talking about when they expect to see the first billion dollar business as in a business valued at a billion dollars run by just one person with the assistance of AI. So certainly Sam Altman is seeing a huge potential for this. Here he's saying that he's extremely excited about this, the potential for founders and entrepreneurs. He's saying if a founder can be 10 times as productive, we will have a lot more and better startups. This works better than having a founding team of 10 people in many ways. Less coordination overhead, for example. Although a 10x productivity gain is still far in the future, I believe it will happen. The resulting economic acceleration in general and for startups in particular will be great. Certainly, for example, with my background in e-commerce, I can see where AI is going to automate a lot of things, greatly reduce a lot of costs, and even some ways will introduce certain abilities that we just didn't have. I mean, the ability to generate images, to generate mock-ups and pictures, etc. that whole process got a whole lot simpler. So if you're designing physical products, that used to be a somewhat a difficult task. You had to hire somebody with experience, somebody with a good eye. Here you're able to rapidly iterate through graphic design, for example, finding the perfect product, creating shots with, you know, AI generated models, like producing like the graphical aspect of it became a whole lot easier. This was a great one. Seriously though, what did Ilya see? I feel like a lot of us wondered at that question, wondered what he saw that kind of uh, made him change his mind, potentially go against Sam Altman and do a lot of like really big moves at OpenAI, eventually leaving OpenAI to find his own company, SSI, Safe Super Intelligence, now valued at, I believe, over a billion. And so Sam Altman here says he saw the transcendent future. Ilya is an incredible visionary. I like how he spells everything lowercase. Notice Ilya. Ilya is an incredible visionary and sees the future more clearly than almost anyone else. His early ideas, excitement, and vision were critical to so much of what we have done. For example, he was one of the key initial explorers and champions for some of the ideas that eventually became O1. The field is very lucky to have him. This is kind of a deep comment, deep answer, I think, because keep in mind, O1 is based in part, that's the strawberry model. Strawberry model used to be the Q star model, that leak that came from that Stanford paper, the uh, Q star self-taught reasoner. And that was the thing that everybody kind of freaked out about during the time of, you know, Sam Altman's exodus from OpenAI. So for example, just like Jeffrey Hinton was, you can say, the initial explorer and a champion of neural nets. He was pushing neural nets forward when a lot of people didn't believe it. It sounds like Ilya was pushing forward the ideas behind QSTAR, how to build a model that is better, that is better able to reason. Now, of course, if people are asking, well, if he was so good to the mission, if he was so good, why did he leave? Certainly, a lot of people have the theory that there's, you know, some tension there. Certainly, Jeffrey Hinton, I believe, commended Ilya for firing Sam Altman. So that's one side of the story. Another way of looking at it is, well, he did walk out, create a brand new company, and that's now valued at over a billion dollars. So certainly there might be something to the fact that he is able to raise those kind of funds and run his own company, his own research lab. Certainly it's probably some combination of all of that that, that led to this. Uh, that's just my guess again. Opinion on people using ChatGPT for therapy. Sam Allen replies, it's obviously not a therapist, but clearly a lot of people get value out of talking about their problems with it. We have seen a lot of startups really exploring how to do more here. I hope someone builds something great. I was very excited about a tool where you sort of, you take notes, kind of like morning pages, or if you have a journal, kind of you're writing on your thoughts. And later, some sort of a large language model, some sort of an AI like this helps you maybe gather some insights from it, help you find those ideas that were kind of like that needle in the haystack that you've written, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago. Certainly, I think large language models would be excellent for that, for that deep kind of introspection. Quick question 
for a, an idea for publishers to verify and register the account with ChatGPT to make sure they're showing it properly, that the citations and stuff like that are being verified. Sam Altman says, great idea. No current plans for that though. If you've ever wondered if Sam Altman likes to troll people on the internet, this question I think shines some light on this very subject. Somebody says, question for Sam Altman, are you the strawberry guy? Sam Altman replies, with an image of a strawberry. Guess how long it took the strawberry guy to make that as part of his uh, Twitter X uh, background. Is this a Sam Altman's alt account that he trolls people through as he continues to alt the world? One of you mentioned that in the comments. It's very good. I like it. This was kind of an interesting kind of open comment about EU. So somebody asked any plans to negotiate with EU so that EU users will get stuff faster and not have it, you know, dumped down. That's a big problem. There's a lot of people complaining that they're not getting access to AI tools in the EU, that it's not working, that there's tons of features missing. And so they're saying, well, why do, doesn't OpenAI and Meta and all these companies, why don't they care about the EU? It's not that they don't care. It's the people that are making the regulations set them up in such a way that it makes it incredibly difficult to have any of this technology. At the recent AI Insiders presentation testimony in front of Congress, one of the people there presenting kind of explained how certain regulations, if it's not done right, could really cripple innovation. The example she mentioned is, for example, let's say you don't want AI models discriminating based on gender, for example. A smart regulator would create kind of a top-level goal so that those companies can kind of work towards that. A more heavy-handed regulation approach might say, do not use gender as a deciding factor for, for any of these models. So kind of like targeting the development level practices with their regulation, which can be extremely short-sighted and cripple innovation because, for example, the companies then can't create a model that can go through, check the data and see if there was any discrimination, right? Because in order to find discrimination, you do have to train a model with that data so you can go and see, is this happening, right? If you can't use that data, if you can't develop models that have that functionality, you know, for good, you're basically, you know, you're passing a lot that has the unintended consequences actually going against what you're trying to achieve. So here Sam Altman is saying that, of course, they're going to follow the EU policy. Obviously, they're not going to try to go around it. But they're saying that all of us hope for increasingly sensible EU policy. A strong Europe is important to the world. Keep in mind that he's very like, you know, soft-spoken. He doesn't make huge statements. So you got to kind of read between the lines. I mean, if somebody more brash and outspoken said the same thing, you know, how you can kind of interpret this is you're saying that EU tends to be bad at creating sensible policies for, for AI, for tech, for innovation, and that they're becoming weaker as a result of it. They're basically destroying themselves and preventing any sort of innovation forward progress at a time what's really important where the whole world is kind of like beginning to move in this direction. And I understand that a lot of you will disagree with me. And I know some of you like the EU laws that are being passed. I'm not here to change anybody's mind. It's just if the question is, why are some of these features in the AI tools not being released in the EU? It's because of the laws that the EU regulators pass. OpenAI, Meta, et cetera, can't really go around them. What's the next breakthrough in the GPT line of products and what's the expected timeline? Some of them saying that we're going to have better and better models, but I think the thing that will feel like the next giant breakthrough will be agents coming soon. Next, we have favorite books. So Sam Altman saying that lots, but the first two that came to mind are The Beginning of Infinity and Siddhartha, a book about a young man that leaves his privileged life to seek a deeper understanding of life and self. Now, the VP of Engineering Srinivas, Reddit handle data is F, said, I enjoyed Life 3.0 by Max Tiegmark, though I don't agree with all his views on AI in general. Yeah, Max Tiegmark said some stuff that struck me as odd in regards to AI, at least, you know, more recently. For example, if you recall who Martin Estrelli is, he's the pharma bro, if you recall that whole saga. He at some point said something along the lines of, uh, screw AI safety, my robot homies are coming to get you, which Max Tiegmark used as an argument in one of the papers that he published that AI insiders don't care about AI safety, and this should make us very concerned. Right here's Max Tiegmark, Department of Physics, MIT, arguing that there's a divide and conquer dynamics in AI-driven disempowerment by these AI insiders. So talking about how this is sort of a uh, anti-human movement, a human disempower movement. And if you scroll down, he's got a list of AI insiders that spoke in a way that seems like they're trying to collaborate against humans or against, you know, human workers, right? Right, we have Mark Zuckerberg, Jan Lacan, Larry Page, and, and this is the, the weird part to me, Martin Shkreli, F AI safety, me and my robot homies are going to come to your house. That's a bit weird, isn't it? The person asked, any timeline on when we'll get AVM vision? 
Why is GPT-5 taking so long? What about the full O1? I was a little bit confused about AVM vision because in regards to AI, AVM could stand for around view monitoring, like in cars, like a 360 sort of view monitoring around the car and, and automated vehicles and self-driving vehicles. So AVM vision, I, I was confused for a little bit. I got to say, thank you to this person that, uh, that pointed out here, advanced voice mode. So certainly this totally makes sense. So now we finally have advanced voice mode activated on desktop, for example but we still don't have the thing that we thought we were getting when they initially kind of demoed the whole thing where you basically have a camera out. And it seemed like it was just looking at the video, kind of like this, the stream of your camera. So whatever you pointed to, that video is able to just kind of like look at the video and, and answer questions about the video. One of the demos, the person pointed the camera at himself and was kind of making sad faces in it. And he would ask, what am I feeling now? And then the, you know, the model of the advanced voice mode that they were demoing would answer, like, you're looking sad, etc. And certainly that's what Google's project Astra seems to be. It's that idea that, you know, you have your Pixel phone or whatever Google Android phone, you're walking around pointing it at, for example, a whiteboard with code on it. I think that was one of their little examples that they did. And you say, how can I improve this code? And then that model responds. I think that's what they're calling Astra. So definitely an interesting question. So Sam Altman saying we're prioritizing shipping O1 and its successors. So we have, you know, sort of like the strawberry family of models. Of course, we have O1 preview that's available to us now. We have the O1 Mini, but the actual sort of O1 itself, the model that they refer to as O1 period, that's not out yet. We don't have access to it yet. A lot of people are confused, but that's not the one that's been released. That's still coming. We also have Orion, whatever that is. And Sam Allen continues that all these models have gotten quite complex and we can't ship as many things in parallel as we'd like to. And interestingly, they're facing a lot of limitations and hard decisions about how they allocated the compute towards many great ideas, right? So the new super rare resource that everybody wants are these NVIDIA chips, you know, the compute, there's only so much of that going around. So they have to make decisions. They can't be training all the models, improving all the models. They're trying to focus on the best thing. And that seems to be the reasoning models, the O1, et cetera, O1, Orion, all of those. And he's saying, we don't have a date for the advanced voice mode vision yet. He answered some questions about, for example, open source. He's answered that question before, so we're not going to go into it. He's also saying that there's going to be some really good releases later this year. So about two months left, it looks like we're going to be hearing some big things, but nothing that's going to be called GPT-5. Someone asked if AGI is achievable with known hardware or will it take something entirely different. Sam Altman saying, we believe it's achievable with current hardware can you feel the AGI? Now, in the past, we've had various members of the OpenAI staff, I think Sam Altman himself, last year were saying how hallucinations in large language models will soon no longer be a problem. One of the questions that came up here was this. Thanks for the great work. Love you and so on. Great way to start. Are hallucinations going to be a permanent feature, right? So is our hallucinations never going away? Why is it that even O1 preview when approaching the end of a thought hallucinates more and more? How will you handle old data, even two years old, that is no longer true? Continuously train models or some sort of a garbage collection. It's a big issue in the truthfulness aspect. So Mark Chan answers, we're putting a lot of focus on decreasing hallucinations, but it's fundamentally, that's a fundamentally hard problem. Our models learn from human written text and humans sometimes confidently declare things that they aren't sure about. Our models are improving at citing, which grounds their answers in trusted sources. And we also believe that reinforcement learning will help with hallucinations as well. When we can programmatically check whether models hallucinate, we can reward it for not doing so. In response to this idea that, you know, humans sometimes confidently declare things that they're unsure about, a follow-up question was, have you considered removing Reddit as a uh, part of the data set? Free code IO if you're watching. Phenomenal. Very good. Very well done. I don't know why you don't have more thumbs up on there, more upvotes on there. I'm not logged in. I would, I would give you a thumbs up on that. And here's uh, Srinivas. So he's the VP of engineering. So he answered a few questions here. For example, let's go back in time of another dimension. If you were a 19-year-old developer thinking about what to do in the next year, what would you make with the OpenAI software or APIs? A couple of ideas, pick your favorite application or product, reimagine what it can be with AI, build something for an agentic future, something that can integrate workflows across applications. They've been hammering hard the idea of the sort of agentic future, both Sam Altman at the Developer Day in London. You know, here the VP of Engineering at OpenAI, there seems to be, they're like, this is a big deal, a reasoning, agentic capabilities, et cetera. They recently released a, a benchmark for testing how well agents 
perform agentic tasks, if you will. So basically, which models and what kind of uh, sort of frameworks work well together to accomplish certain goals. And specifically, they're looking at machine learning tasks, as in tasks that people that do machine learning research do, right? So collecting data sets, training models to complete a particular task, etc. And somebody asks if uh, once AGI is achieved, what is the first thing that you would like to apply it on? Is there a certain field on speed dial for that moment? Serena Moss is answering, I'd love for it to accelerate scientific discovery. I'm personally very interested in health slash medicine. That is huge. Uh, if you've missed it, so Demi Sasabis, the founder, the CEO of Google DeepMind, made some pretty impressive statements about where he thinks some of this AI discovery in, in, in health and medicine will go. He's specifically talking about, you know, for example, the alpha fold model. They have another model called the alpha proteo, right? So this idea of proteomics, right? So the study of proteins and their functions and how we can maybe potentially even create designer proteins, proteins that that bind to other proteins, allowing us to have more of a control over, you know, the human body, for example, and some of the processes that run in there. And he's at some point during an interview says that he believes it might be possible that I think he said like all disease might be cured within the next 10 to 20 years. Like he's seeing that as a possibility, um, which is kind of bonkers to think about. But certainly if we're learning how to design like the building blocks of life and we're understanding more about their function and AI unlocks some of that, I mean, I guess, I guess it's not far fetched. Someone asked, what's the best personal assistant workflow you've seen? Two that are very interesting to him are one, using it to summarize medical reports and help you ask the right questions to doctors. I've been very impressed with its ability to go through contracts and, and pull out these tiny little things that you might have missed. You upload, for example, a lease agreement. You say, list all of the possible fees that are included. And I did it to a few of my old uh, lease agreements. And I was blown away because there's a lot more fees that are kind of mentioned in there than I would have picked up on. And not all of them would you be able to find if you just, you know, control F and typed in fee or something like that. Because some of them are sort of like provide compensation if the carpet is destroyed or if the carpet is not in its original form. So it's like, it's not a fee, but there's a, uh, I mean, you're going to get charged a fee if this something's not the way it's supposed to be. If you had a chance to uh, try the new search feature in ChatGPT where it searches the web for you, when somebody asks, is ChatGPT search still using Bing as the search engine behind the scenes? The VP of engineering is answering, we use a set of services and Bing is an important one. So it sounds like maybe they're pulling in a few different things. They've certainly made a lot of connections with various publishing companies, uh, AP News amongst many, many others. You might have seen them kind of announcing it. So they're making partnerships with publishers in the new space. So certainly I'm sure they're pulling from them more often than they would from someone with whom they don't have some sort of an arrangement or an agreement. And one thing that jumped at me from one of Kevin Whale's answers is he was asked if ChatGPT will be able to perform tasks on its own. The response was, in my honest opinion, this is going to be a big theme in 2025. So those are some of the big things that jumped out at me. Let me know what you thought about this. Anything that kind of changed the way you were thinking about it? To me, certainly a lot of this does kind of reinforce the idea that agent and various agentic tasks done by these large language models, it'll be a much bigger priority. And it's certainly going to be interesting to see how the world changes and how it adapts to that. One thing that wasn't mentioned here that was mentioned at the developer day in London was mentioned by Sam Altman. He said something along the lines of, uh, without spoiling anything, I would expect there to be big advancements or breakthroughs in the realm of image-based models. And they didn't really elaborate as to what that means, but they were talking about, you know, a reasoning through words versus sort of visual reasoning. And then he kind of says, well, we might have a breakthrough in image-based models. So it certainly seems like maybe the next big thing is something like potentially, and this is just me guessing, please don't take this for anything more than just a guess, but some sort of an O1 model, some sort of that kind of a reasoning model, but more, again, image-based, as Sam Altman said. So maybe a model being able to reason really well, but with a primary focus on recognizing images and visual reasoning. In the past, for example, these models, for example, would be really bad at like 
understanding, for example, the speedometer, right? Those old school speedometers where the thing goes up as you increase the speed, they would be very bad at those. There's certain charts that they would be great at, but then there's just certain cha charts that they couldn't even make any sense of if it was like a little bit weird. Their ability to just like recognize and kind of reason through it was just completely lost. So certainly vision-based reasoning models would be a big, big addition to what we already have. And also seemingly they're looking into kind of like merging and combining a lot of these models. So potentially the O1 might be the reasoner for text. A vision model would be kind of like merged with that in some way to help with the visual reasoning. Again, that's just my guess. I don't know if if that's that part is true or not, but based on some of the things that they're saying, this seems like maybe this is where it's going. Because notice he's saying there's going to be a lot more progress and releases around kind of like the O1 type of models. So seemingly there's like multiple things that are coming that are kind of focused in that direction. So let me know what you think in the comments. If you're one of the people in there asking questions on Reddit, let me know. It's uh, kind of cool to see. With that said, my name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching.